So today's topic is Brown versus Board of Education, and <clears throat> I wanted to talk about it because this unit is about the judiciary, the federal courts, and Brown is the most, one of the most famous cases in Supreme Court history, um, if not the most famous. And uh, it's part of a series of important and interesting cases that changed life all over the country, especially in the South. And so it's interesting to use this as an example of how courts can affect people's lives and influence policy and change American history. I want to start <coughs> the story of Brown a hundred years before, almost. <clears throat> with three amendments called the Reconstruction Amendments or sometimes the Civil War Amendments. And so you can see that Brown was part of the culmination of a hundred years of fighting to institute these amendments, to make them reality. So you had the 13th Amendment, which was 1865, and it banned slavery. And then you had the 14th Amendment, 1868, and it had two really important parts for the Civil Rights Movement, at least. One was the Due Process Clause, and then the one that's really at the heart of Brown versus Board of Education, the Equal Protection Clause. And then you have the 15th Amendment, which I won't talk about much in this lesson, but it's about voting. It guarantees the right to vote. So the Equal Protection Clause, I have it right there. Um, the, 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 the paragraph from the 14th Amendment that is probably the most important is this one. It says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So that last clause, deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. You'll see a series of cases about the question does having segregated schools, either K through 12 or colleges, does that deny equal protection of the laws? Right? And eventually, of course, Brown is going to say, yes, it does. Shortly after these constitutional amendments were ratified, a series of segregate, segregation, segregating laws were passed mostly in southern state legislatures, and these mandated the separation of the races in restaurants, hotels, uh, railroad cars, etc. And these laws came to be known or nicknamed as Jim Crow laws. And almost immediately, people began to challenge the constitutionality of these laws. The first great challenge was Plessy versus Ferguson. And you could consider Plessy versus Ferguson as kind of the opposite of Brown versus Board. Whereas Brown versus Board of Education is widely considered one of the best Supreme Court decisions of all time, at least in terms of what it achieved. Plessy is one of the worst. Well, the <coughs> situation is this. Uh, Homer Adolph Plessy was this man. He was born in New Orleans in 1862, and he was considered uh, legally, according to Louisiana's statutes, its codes, a free person of color. In other words, it was 1862, it was still the Civil War. He wasn't born into slavery, but he was one-eighth black. His great-grandmother was African. And you can tell by the picture, he and his family could pass for white based on his appearance. 
But he became active as a young man in fighting against segregation. And in 1890, Louisiana passed something called the Separate Car Act. And it mandated segregated facilities in public places like railroad cars. So he was working with a group called the Citizens Committee. This was people in Louisiana that wanted to overturn or challenge this law. And what he did in 1892, he was 30 years old, he bought a first class ticket on the East Louisiana Railroad and sat in the whites only section. What's interesting is the conductor didn't know he wasn't legally entitled to sit there because just based on his parents, the conductor assumed he was white. He told the conductor he was one eighth black and then the conductor said, well, then you have to move to the colored section. And he said, no, I refuse to move. They stopped the train, he was ejected, he was arrested and spent the night in jail and was released on a $500 bond. So he is arrested for violating this law, this separate car act, and he challenges the constitutionality of the law. He says it violated his equal protection rights under the 14th Amendment, right? Treating him unequally because of his race. The case reached the Supreme Court in 1896, and the Supreme Court ruled eight to one against him. This was the Supreme Court at the time, and Justice Henry Billings Brown wrote the majority opinion. He said the object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the equality of the two races before the law. But in the nature of things, it could not have been intended, intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to endorse social as distinguished from political equality. If one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them on the same plane. Now this, I've read the whole opinion. This is kind of, to me, gibberish. Um, what he's saying is the 14th Amendment was meant to guarantee equality before the law but not necessarily social equality, which makes sense. This amendment says you have to treat legally, the government has to treat everyone equally. Socially, they might not like each other, but that's a different matter, right? Socially, they might think of themselves as better or worse than each other, but the law has to treat them equally. And in this case, it was Louisiana law that was treating them unequally, so it seems like he's kind of evading the issue by talking about social stuff. Anyway, what the opinion came up with was the doctrine of separate but equal. The court said that you could still separate the races without violating the Equal Protection Clause if you treated them equally. So just the fact that they sit in separate cars doesn't mean their equal rights are being violated. Right? Now, this created a fiction that lasted for 50 years. Everyone knew that the railroad cars weren't equal. Everyone knew that the public schools weren't equal. The white schools got more funding than the black schools, had more qualified teachers, newer books, newer facilities. The white railroad cars were more luxurious, better equipped than the railroad cars for black people. But this allowed the court to ignore what was really going on and say it didn't violate the Equal Protection Clause, this separate but equal doctrine. One justice disagreed with the opinion, and he wrote in his dissent our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. It's a famous dissent. It's studied in constitutional law classes in law schools every year. What he's saying is the Constitution, with the 14th Amendment in place, does not permit the government to distinguish among races. It's no longer allowed. So he's saying he doesn't even care about this separate but equal stuff. Doesn't matter if the railroad cars are equal or not. 
the government is no longer allowed to classify citizens among different racial groups. That's the way he interprets the Equal Protection Clause to me. Uh, but he was one vote, so obviously he lost, right? Plessy versus Ferguson would be the law for the next 60 years. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was established in 1909, and it almost immediately began fighting, well, it fought lots of things. It fought against lynchings, which were a major problem uh, in the South and the West, mostly in the South, uh, for the first several decades of the 1900s. Um, it also fought against Jim Crow. The NAACP created the Legal Defense and Education Fund. <coughs> this is Charles Hamilton Houston. He was the leader of the legal, excuse me, the Legal Defense and Education Fund from 1935 to 1938. He would retire to private practice in 1938, and then a guy named uh, John Marshall or Thurgood Marshall, excuse me, not John Marshall. That was a Supreme Court Chief Justice in the 1800s. Thurgood Marshall would take over. Under Houston and then under Thurgood Marshall, the NAACP would begin to challenge, one by one, segregation in schools and universities. And they started by focusing on universities. Here's an example of one of the cases they won. Uh, the University of Maryland School of Law rejected applicants based on their race. And around 1933, Thurgood Marshall, who you can see there on the left, started looking for a good case to challenge what they were doing. Donald Gaines Murray was rejected in 1935 and they sued in the Baltimore City Court. They argued that since the black law schools that he would have to attend in Maryland were nowhere near the same caliber as the university's law school, the university was violating the principle of separate but equal. <coughs> so notice, <clears throat> they're not arguing that Plessy has to be overturned. They're not arguing against the principle of separate but equal, but they're arguing the Maryland School, the University of Maryland School of Law is so much better in terms of money, financing, books, teachers, than the schools that would admit black students that it was a farce to claim that it was equal, right? And they won. The Baltimore City Court agreed and the next year, the Court of Appeals, this is 1936, also agreed with Murray, uh, Donald Gaines Murray, and his lawyer, Thurgood Marshall, and they ordered the law school to admit him, and in 1938, he graduated, 1938-1939. Another case, Missouri X. Rel Gaines versus Canada, 1938. This is Lloyd Gaines. In 1936, he applied to the University of Missouri Law School, and he was rejected because he was black. Missouri knew that they were violating the Constitution, right? So they tried to get around that. They gave him two options. They said, we will build an all-black law school for you. You can't attend this one, but we'll build one for you. <laughs> or you can go to any law school outside of the state of Missouri and we'll pay for it. He rejected those options and with Thurgood Marshall uh, defending him, he sued. In 1938, the court reached the US Supreme, the case reached the US Supreme Court and the court sided with him. It said that sending him to another school out of the state or promising to build a brand new school just for him was obviously not equal to allowing him to, to the quality of, edu of legal education he received 
right there at the law school at Missouri. So he won, they were ordered to admit him. Then you have a case here in Texas, Heman Sweat versus Painter. The University of Texas had, uh, was the white law school and they rejected Heman Sweat in 1946. They hastily set up a law school for black students because they knew they were in constitutional trouble. Rather than go to the black school, he sued. The case reached the US Supreme Court in 1950, and the court unanimously agreed with him. It said that the white school, the University of Texas at Austin, was so much better than the one they set up for black students that he could not receive an equal education there. This violated the separate but equal doctrine, and so they were ordered to admit him to law school. You see pictures of him there registering for classes after he won the case. Here, in Oklahoma, you have George McLaurin, and he was admitted to a doctoral program. I don't remember, I don't know what he was studying, but it was a, it was a graduate student program. But they treated him really awfully. They admitted him to the program, but they required him to sit apart from the rest of the class. So here you see the class he's attending. And he's given a seat in the corner. He's not allowed to sit with the other students. They ordered him to eat lunch at a separate time and table from the white students. So he could go to the school, but they literally segregated him from the other students the whole time he was there. He sued. And the US Supreme Court agreed with him on the same day that it ordered the University of Texas to integrate its law school. They said that the actions of the university were adversely affecting his ability to learn and ordered that they cease immediately. So all of those cases were chipping away. They were using the principle of separate but equal to kind of chip away at segregation in higher education, in universities, and gradually ordering them to uh, integrate and to accommodate black applicants. But now Brown versus Board of Education addresses the much more controversial, trickier education of young children, right? Elementary children was much more controversial in high school children than universities. So this is the situation before Brown was decided. You can see segregation was only required in the southern states and in Oklahoma. There were some states that had no legislation at all regarding it. There were other states where there was limited or optional segregation, depending on the school district. And then there were many states where it was forbidden to racially segregate schools, the northern states and some of the western states. And what is interesting about this, in other words, if you looked at the majority of the country, most of the country was had realized by now that segregation was either unconstitutional or immoral or both, but you see the big pocket of red states in the South that was still holding to segregation. <coughs> so the Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education is actually a consolidation of five separate cases. Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP argued cases in different states around the country, Virginia, Delaware, um, I don't remember where else, and Kansas. In Kansas, you had Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. And it was a class action lawsuit, that means it represented not one plaintiff, but a class of plaintiffs. One person represented other people who were similarly situated. 
So there were 13 Topeka parents on behalf of 20 children suing the school board of Topeka, Kansas. In Topeka, the Board of Education operated separate elementary schools, not junior and high schools. They integrated in junior and high school, but the elementary schools were separated. So they had separate facilities for black and white students. Oliver Brown was the named plaintiff, and his daughter, Linda Carroll Brown, was the person on whose behalf he was suing. She had to walk six blocks to a bus stop to ride a bus to Monroe Elementary, the black school. But the white school was only seven blocks away in the other direction. In other words, for about the same effort and less time, she could have walked to the white school instead of walking and being bused to the black school. In 1951, her father and the other parents involved in the case tried to enroll her in the white school and was turned away and then he and the NAACP sued. Remember the three levels that I've told you for federal courts. You have a district court, and then you have an appellate court, and then you have a Supreme Court. And a court case normally starts here, and then if you lose, you appeal to here, and if you lose your appeal to the Supreme Court, it works its way up the ladder. Here, because Congress had decided the jurisdiction in a kind of unusual way, because this was a special type of constitutional challenge, um, there was a three-judge panel that heard the case. And the judge in the center there, his name is Walter Huxman, he wrote the opinion for the panel and he ruled against Brown, against the family. He upheld the constitutionality of the Topeka segregation. He found, as a matter of fact, because of the trial's uh, testimony and so forth, he found that segregation in public education has a detrimental effect on black children. So that was just a finding of fact. However, because the quality of the schools, in terms of the funding, the teachers, and so forth, were actually roughly equal in Topeka, he decided that because of the Plessy uh, precedent, that he had to follow that precedent, and it was not unconstitutional. In other words, the segregated facilities were actually equal in Kansas. They were equally funded, the teachers were equally trained and so forth. And so he said, well, this clearly hurts the black children, but I have to follow the precedent in Plessy, and so he upheld it. So they sued then to the US Supreme Court. So they go directly here. And in 1952, the case reaches the US Supreme Court. The other cases involved were interesting. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned there was a Virginia, did I mention there's a Virginia case? A Virginia case, a Delaware case, a South Carolina case, a Washington DC case. The case in Virginia started with a 16 year old girl walking out of school to protest segregation and ended up in the Supreme Court. In the Delaware case, it was the only one of the five cases where the district court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. In Delaware, the case, it was called Gephardt, but you don't need to remember that. Um, the judge in Delaware looked at the facilities and decided that they were so unequal, the black schools were so poorly funded, etc., that it did violate separate but equal, and the Delaware judge ordered the schools to be integrated. So all five of these cases reached the Supreme Court in 1952. The NAACP and the Brown plaintiffs were helped by the United Auto Workers. This was one of the most powerful unions in the country at the time, if not the most powerful. It was led by Walter Ruther, who is pictured there on the right. 
He was a friend and ally of the NAACP for many years, and he donated $75,000 to pay for their expenses uh, in the Supreme Court. The president at the time was Truman, and you can see him on the left meeting with Walter Ruther. Under him, the Justice Department supported the NAACP and the Brown families. They filed a friend of the court brief. This is what you call it when someone who is not a party to the case, not Brown, not Board of Education, but they have an interest in the outcome of the case, so they file a brief, which is an argument, like an essay, with the court suggesting how they think the court should rule. And so the US Department of Justice filed a brief on behalf of the plaintiffs, the Brown family, asking them to declare this unconstitutional. And what's interesting about it is they had an argument that was mostly based on United States foreign policy. Do any of you know what war was going on in the world in 1952? No? I'll give you a hint. Our enemy was Russia. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the Soviet Union. What do you call the war that the United States fought against Russia in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s? No idea? It's on the tip of your tongue? We were fighting the Cold War. It wasn't a hot war, right, with guns and tanks and stuff. It was fought with espionage, with spies. It was fought with placing nuclear weapons to threaten each other, but hopefully never use them, and that sort of thing. And what the Truman administration said was, there are all kinds of countries around the world, in Africa and Asia, and they're just trying to decide if they want to ally with the United States or with the Russians. And this sort of thing, school segregation, makes us look bad and it makes them not want to be our allies against Russia. So for foreign policy, we hope that school segregation is struck down. One of the interesting things, so Thurgood Marshall argued the case before the Supreme Court. He would later become the first black man on the Supreme Court, uh, 15 years later. He argued first that segregated schools are unconstitutional. They violate the Equal Protection Clause of the, amend of the 14th Amendment. And he also had an interesting thing. He used uh, evidence from sociological tests administered by this guy, Kenneth Clark, and his wife, Mamie. From the 40s, 50s, and on, they had been using doll, they had been conducting these doll tests where they would give black and white dolls, identical dolls, except the skin color was changed. Well, it's plastic, but the color of the doll was changed. And they would give them to black children and ask them to identify the dolls and to tell which one they preferred. And the results overwhelmingly were that they preferred the white dolls. And the implication of the test, according to the sociologist, was that this was the uh, damage that was being done by segregation that they were internalizing this idea that their color was inferior, less attractive, less valuable, and so forth. The justices in 1952 heard the case and wanted to reverse Plessy versus Ferguson and declare segregation in public schools unconstitutional, but they couldn't agree on reasoning and what argument to use. And they decided to rehear the case in 1953, to listen to more arguments, basically. So they convened to rehear it, but in the interim, the Chief Justice, his name was Fred Vinson, but you don't need to remember that, he had died. And a new Chief Justice, this man in the center, Earl Warren, was chosen to replace him. He had been the Governor of California, and he was now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So they reheard the case in 1953. 
And Chief Justice Warren got the other justices to agree to issue a unanimous opinion. He issued the opinion on May 14, 1954. 1954. Warren wrote the opinion. And the key phrase is this. He said, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. So, Plessy was overturned. No longer did it matter if the facilities were of equal caliber or not. The court was saying it is by definition a violation of the constitutional rights just because it's segregation by race. And that's where I'll stop for today.